And so what I anticipate is in the morning, I've got 100 coming up in the morning, and we're starting at 8.30. Um, I anticipate uh, by the lunch break, hopefully, depending on how people raise their hand, if, you know, I don't know what the numbers are going to be. Um, and that's what you can't predict. Um, but what I'm hoping is that by noon, we will have spoken individually to everyone who raised their hand to that question. I also will be asking all of them, once I give them a trial estimate, which is what we're still discussing, the length of the trial, who believes it might be a hardship to serve on the jury if they're selected. I'll explain to them what a hardship is, what it's not. Um, and those folks will also raise their hand and I will speak with them about their hardship. Now the hardships, uh, I, may, I may do that as a group because that's not an issue that uh, really involves um, any disclosures which could be prejudicial. Um, so the hardship I may just do as a group. Anyone who raises their hand as to knowledge will be individually or dire, outside the presence of all other potential jurors. So that's the process. So now you're saying six days. I think it depends on how you rule on a lot of these evidentiary issues today, um, especially relating to the prior bad acts. You just don't want to give me an answer, do you, Mr. Russell? <laughs> <laughs> it also, um, you know, there are some scheduling considerations of me being out of the country. I haven't ruled on that yet, so and this is all going to play into it. Well, I've got, I've got to have an estimate of time. I mean, I, I mean, I can repeat the question at the end of this hearing. Uh, right now, what I'll get to the hearing and then readdress that, Judge. I'll, I'll, get, I'll grant you that, but I'm, I'm, before we end this hearing, you're going to tell me how long you think it's going to take to try this case, because I've got to tell that to these, these potential jurors. Right now, what I believe, based on what I'm hearing, is um, that it's probably two days for jury selection, which will be this week, and five days for the actual trial. So seven days altogether is what I'm believing at this point. Um, what I always tell and I'm at this point, um, what I always tell, and I'll give you an opportunity to respond further to that at the end of the hearing, um, what, I, what I believe, <clears throat> no, not what I believe, what I always tell jurors is that's our good faith estimate. It could go over a day, it could finish a day early, I don't know. And so I always give them a little bit of wiggle room. Um, but we're going to have people this time of year with planned trips, et cetera, so we've got to take that into account. So that's how I'm going to handle it. Um, we might as well discuss this topic right now, too, since you're wanting to know uh, procedure in terms of answering that question. I'm limiting voir dire in terms of time. Um, after my questions, this does not count with respect to questions on publicity. You're going to have an opportunity to fully, anyone who says they believe they know something about this case, I will begin the questioning and then each of you will have an opportunity to follow up individually and ask whatever questions you wish of those um, potential jurors. So this does not the time limits I'm going to set does not include that, that, that time. We'll spend whatever time is necessary to root out that issue. Um, I'm going to ask and then I'm going to tell. <laughs> so Mr. Williams, how long do you think it's going to take you for Vore Dyer reasonably in this case? No more than an hour and a half. Ms. Roosevelt. With that many jurors, it being a first degree felony, I'd say three to four hours, Judge. won't be that many jurors. You will not be questioning 200 jurors. The whole idea is, here's what I'm going to do. Even with 50 jurors, I would say, this being a first degree felony, three to four hours, Judge. Okay, the, lot, the limit is two hours. I'm going to be prepared, because I want crisp, clean questions. I, I don't want you know, a lot of pontificating, et cetera. The presumptive time limit is two hours. When you reach your presumptive time limit, if you've not covered topics that you believe need to be co covered, you'll just have to come up to me and tell me what is it you haven't covered uh, and why hasn't it been covered, and then I'll decide whether to grant more time. But you need to then I'll decide whether to grant more time. But you need to be prepared presumptively for two hours um, in this case, because you won't be, you will not be questioning 200 jurors. 50 or 60 probably is the number we're going to be looking for at the end of the day after hardship and publicity. So kind of figure that into your. Um, into your schedule. Um, I think I've told you the procedure for tomorrow. That's what we're going to do. That's all. You guys, except for asking questions about publicity, you will not be starting. I'll be doing all the talking tomorrow. I, I have a question. So what if you go through the first hundred and we're left with 80 jurors? 
I hope I have that problem. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I mean, I, and I'll face it when I, I get there. We, I, if I go through 200 jurors and we discover that there's just a round number, 100 jurors that are left that don't have a hardship, don't have any problems on publicity, I don't think we need 100 people to pick a jury in this case. It's, a, it's, it's six strikes aside. I need, at the end of the day, I need, I need standing after cause challenges and everything else. I, I need uh, 18 to pick the jury, 21 if I want one alternate, 24 if I want two. That's um, my question. So if we start with 100 and we end up with 50 or 60, why can't we just go with that first group? Cancel well, we might. We, 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 we may. But we got to, I, 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 Is that on five days? If we do that plan, I think it'd be done. Okay, but I, I need to make sure, I, I need to make sure that in a case like this, I've got plenty of jurors to, to, to pick from because what, here, here's what's going to happen. I'll just tell you right now. Two things are going to happen. There will be people tomorrow who do not raise their hand to either question who will come back on Friday and say, all of a sudden, I forgot I'm going to see my Aunt Millie on Tuesday, so I've got a hardship. Or all of a sudden, I remember something about this case. And so I'm going to instruct them, this is a continuing duty that they have, on, particularly on the publicity, to disclose to us if at any time, all of a sudden, a little light bulb goes on and say, oh, I remember something about this case. There's going to be a continuing duty to disclose that to us by the same method, the raising of the hand. So, yeah, you can say we get to the end of the first uh, you know, session and we've, we've got a, a significant number of people left. I still have to account and take into account the fact that you're going to lose more uh, even after that. It always happens, particularly on hardship. But in this case, it's probably going to happen on publicity, too. So using the phrase Kastronakis likes to use, you want to make sure you have extra beer in the fridge. You've got to make sure that you got enough jurors to get this case uh, tried. So um, I'll just see what we've got when we're done. You know, I, 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 Jury selection, I, I, I planned on two days is what I planned on. So if it takes two days, it takes two days. Okay, um, so that's the procedure for tomorrow. You will not be asking any substantive questions tomorrow other than publicity questions because you know, be prepared to follow up on those questions. Um, but you will not need to be prepared to begin your normal voir dire questions until Friday. All right. Um, statement of the facts. Candidly, um, I've revised the statement of the facts. I, I, I looked at both. Um, the defense statement, there was too much advocacy in there, candidly, for Mr. Roosevelt. That's not the purpose of this statement of the facts. So what I've done, and I'll give you a copy of this. I should have brought an extra copy in earlier, but I'll read it to you and then um, I'll, I'll take any comments. But it's basically somewhat of a blending of the two. Um, what I intended to do is to say in the summer of 2009, the defendant, Ms. Dahlia DiPolito, was accused of hiring a person to kill her then-husband, Michael DiPolito. The person she allegedly, I put in the word allegedly, the person she allegedly hired turned out to be an undercover Boynton Beach police officer. Ms. DiPolito denies any attempt to kill her husband. Reports relating to this case have appeared in the local and national media, including the television show Cops. I want to talk to you about that last statement of mine and why I think it might be significant to put that in there. Um, but that's what I'm intending, at least now presumptively, to read to them. It's a blending of the two. Um, I think it's important, and I don't do this in all cases with publicity, I uh, usually just stick to the statement of the facts. I think it is, in this case, important to alert them that there has been media coverage, both locally and nationally, and to, make specific, and to make specific reference to the show Cops without getting into any details about it. And the reason for that is, though I don't know the defense, but I mean, I don't know it in detail, so part of the defense in this case, in terms of the entrapment, is going to relate to the use of, uh, or, or the you know, appearance of the cops television crew there, those types of things. So I think that's going to come out sometime during the course of this case as being consistent with the defense theory of the case. And so I think rather than just say it's gotten both local and national attention, I think I have to make reference to the television show because it may, it, it may jar someone's memory. And so I think it's kind of important to have that in there. 
Um, but that's what I intend uh, to read. I'll hear any objections to that. I'll hear any comments to that. But I've, I've looked at the two that you've given me. As I said, Mr. Roosevelt, yours was, uh, you know, frankly, it, it, it had statements that were advocacy in it. And I'm not trying to advocate in here. I'm just trying to make a brief statement of the facts that's going to jog memories is what I want. How does, just a comment, how does the defendant denying trying to hire him and a killer husband go towards refreshing people's memory, whether they know about the case? Well, it only goes with, it, 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 it specifically, it doesn't accept you, you, the, the first statement is she's been accused of, okay, and we, we all know about the presumption of innocence, okay, um, and so to, to make it a, um, to make it a statement of fact that she hired a person to kill her husband, I think it's better at all times to couch it in terms of allegations. And so you said you used the word allegedly. She's accused. Allegedly. And alleged. That's what I did. So then why the statement that you she's denying? You need the word deny, Judge. Otherwise, it's advocating for the state. It's taking. I, I, the only reason. The only reason I put that. I understand what you're asking. Um, the reason I put that in there was. The, this goes back to my days in civil, probably. But in every civil case, you read a statement of the facts. Not, not because of publicity, you just read a statement of the facts. Um, and generally speaking, um, what you do is you state the plaintiff's position, defense position, the summary. Okay? Um, because there's an accusation here, and, and um, we're talking about her being accused of a crime, I think it's important just to indicate that she's denying her intent to kill. I don't think it makes... Any difference with respect to publicity? I just think it's a fairness issue. That's all in terms of the statement. So you can object to it. I'm probably going to leave it in there, Mr. Williams. But it's just it's just a fairness issue when you're reading something to the jury. My, my, my only concern, Judge, is the statement of the facts. If she wants to deny it, she should take the stand and deny it. Well, she's denied it by pleading not guilty. I understand that, but <laughs> by putting that in there, that's a statement of fact that she's denying doing it. That's, that's not fair to put that in there. That's like putting in there that the prosecution believes she's absolutely guilty. I understand, that's, that's, I understand what you're saying. That's, that's, that's my argument. But I'm going to overly objection. I'm just okay. gonna, it's more just like a set of a fairness issue. So um, I'm, I'm going to put it in there. I, I mean, technically, you're probably correct, but I, I'm, I think it's a fairness issue. I'm going to leave it in there. Um, I don't think it's going to make any difference in terms of how this case is tried ultimately. Um, okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Any comments, Mr. Rosenfeld, that you have? Uh, if I can defer with my client for one moment, Your Honor. Sure. And if you want, I'll print you both a copy of it. I don't need one, Judge. We're fine with that, Judge. Okay. All right. So um, that leads us to the substantive part of the motion. I've got, I don't really care which of these motions are argued first. Um, there are a number. Um, and so pretty much since they're all defense motions, you just tell me where you want to start. And we'll go from there. Well, I guess before we start, um, for procedural purposes, we're going to renew our motion to continue based on the arguments made at the previous hearing. Okay, and I'm going to deny that motion for the reasons I stated before. I think we should probably start with the allegations that Ms. DiBolito was an escort and the outrageous allegations about her attempting to poison her then husband. Uh, let me ask a question, Mr. Williams. I, I usually do this on, on motions and limiting. I'm assuming you reviewed all the motions. I did. Is there any other than that you agreed to and we don't have to argue about it? Neither one of those came in on the prior trial either, so that's, that's fine. We're not, we're not bringing that stuff in. All right, so that's what I thought. I thought there was probably some things that are not coming, so let's just be specific, okay? So there's a motion, um, motion limiting to exclude allegations the defendant was an escort. Um, state is not contesting that motion, so that motion will be granted. Is that right, Mr. Williams? Yes, sir. All right. Pen's working here. Okay, there's also a motion in limiting uh, to exclude evidence that the defendant allegedly attempted to poison Michael DiPolito. You're indicating that you're not intending to put that evidence on, so you're agreeing? Not that you come in the last trial either, Judge. Okay, so that motion's granted. I'm just going to read the motion. Tell me which ones you disagree with and agree with. How's that, uh, Mr. Williams? Um, well, there's a motion, an amended motion, in limiting to exclude video of staged crime scene. Uh, 
Was there much difference between the motion and the amended motion in terms of the crime scene? Um, no, Your Honor. I just added section. Let me see. I think it was page four. I mean, there's no substantive difference, right? No, I just added some language from your order denying the motion to dismiss. Oh, you just threw my own language back at me. All right. Okay. I guess uh, on that note, we'd also renew the motion to dismiss for objective entrapment prior to starting trial. Okay. Well, again, I wrote an order on that, so I'm going to continue to deny that. Um, all right. The next motion, uh, a couple more motions. Motion and limiting to exclude video of defendant at Boynton Beach Police Department. It sounds like from reading the motion, there were, were there two interviews, recorded interviews? There are, two, there are two recorded interviews. Okay, and so there's a motion to exclude those interviews. I don't know what those interviews reveal, if anything, but um, is the state contesting that one? Yes, Judge. Okay, you're going to contest that one. All right. And then motion and limiting to exclude evidence of prior bad acts. Judge, these are all our rulings from the previous trial. Uh, we're just relying on all those, and these were, these were all admitted in the prior trial. Well, then you are objecting yeah. to this motion. Okay, so I, I will have to, it's been filed, but I'm going to have to at least hear argument on it. Um, okay, so there's two motions and limiting that you disagree on. We're going to hear argument on that. Then there's the motion to dismiss um, or in the alternative for spoilation instruction. I know the state's not agreeing to that one, so. Well, I mean, if they present evidence during the trial that there's, if they put witnesses on that say that there was a, a video there and that someone destroyed it or. or well, I know, but that's the legal argument that they're, they're making, if I, from my review of the motion and the memorandum, the, and I'm going to find out about this when we argue the motion, but I, I think there's a legal issue here I have to take up. Um, trial motion, Judge, yes. Well, no, but I mean, which, which motion you want to do next? And if you, if you want to do this one first, we'll get into what the legal issue I'm talking about. It's up to you, Judge. All right, my choice, let's, let's do the one that has the most substance to it. Let's do the motion to dismiss um, or exclude evidence and testimony or the alternative for the spoilation issue. Let, let me frame the issue for you because I've read the motion because much of what is contained in this motion was contained in the motion to dismiss based on outrageous government conduct. So the evidence, I believe, is essentially the same, um, unless you can point to some other evidence that I've not considered before. So let me try to frame the issue and make sure I understand factually what the issue is, if there is a factual issue, and then what the legal issue is. My reading of the motion is um, that you're moving to dismiss or you're asking for spoilation instruction based on three separate things. One would be the failure of the Boynton Beach Police Department to record um, their interview at the station with Mr. Shaheda, the three-hour interview. Um, the failure to record numerous telephone calls between Mr. Shaheda and Ms. DiPolito and the failure to record the encounter between Ms. DiBolito and Mr. Shaheda at Shillings. Is that right? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now let me ask you a factual question, all right? Because I think this is where Mr. Williams was going. Factually, what we're talking about here is a failure to record, not a destruction or loss of something that was recorded. Is that correct? Um, yes and no, depending on which incident you're referring to. In regard to... Tell, tell me which ones are... All right, in regard to the phone calls, I think we need additional testimony. I know in Your Honor's order denying the motion to dismiss in regard to objective entrapment, um, you indicated some confusion and that there was some contradiction as to some of the testimony between the officers and Muhammad. I think we need to revisit that. Uh, I think that he did. That was as to the Chili's encounter, I think. Correct, but as to the phone calls, he did testify that he was tapped in at some points. And it's unclear when he was tapped in, where all those recordings are, how many times he was tapped in, and if those were destroyed. And we need right, to right. delve here's, further into here's that. Here's the question I have for you, because you, you filed a motion, you're going to have um, at least the initial burden on this. Um, do you have any evidence that 
For example, let me start, I'll go one by one, all right? Any evidence that the, the meeting with Mr. Shaheda with the Boynton Beach Police Department, the three-hour encounter, was recorded, but has now been lost or destroyed? In regard to the first one, no. In regard to the first interview, um, it wasn't properly gathered or preserved. In regard to well, we're, we're going to talk about what the meaning of preserve is under the case law, but sure. I'm just trying to get factually. So on the first issue, it's a failure to record, not that there was a recording that was later not preserved. Yes, Your Honor. All right. So that's number one. All right. Number two, series of phone calls. Actually, let me go to number three first, because number two is sounding like it's going to be more complicated. Number three, that's the meeting at Chili's. Do you have any evidence that the recording actually existed, but has been lost or destroyed, or is it a failure to record? I think the testimony was that there was a malfunction in the recording. There were suggestions that they should wait until they could record. But the evidence, I thought, supported the conclusion that there never was a recording of that. We do have evidence, Your Honor, and I've, since that hearing... Evidence of what? Um, I've went ahead and uh, requested and received the maintenance log for the past, I believe, five years. It's one of the exhibits attached to this motion, but I emailed to Your Honor that shows that these, there was, I guess, no report of these wiring devices going in for repair in a five-year period. I think that was brought up at the motion. That was not, and that was one of the issues we wanted to, um, or we addressed in the motion to reopen the hearing. We asked to call some witnesses to testify as to that, and Your Honor denied that. Um, and we, we do now have the maintenance logs. We did not have those yeah, at the time. Beyond the maintenance logs. Well, the maintenance log shows that um, if they're claiming that it malfunctioned, and there's no maintenance logs, then clearly they destroy these recordings. What else happened to them? Well, beyond saying I've got a maintenance log that doesn't show that anything was maintained, is there any other independent evidence that such a tape ever existed? Um, no, Your Honor, aside from Mr. Shiati's testimony that he was wired and uh, Boyd's Beach's testimony that they malfunctioned in the absence of any maintenance logs corroborating their version of what happened. And that's concerning, Judge. All right, but there's no, there's no, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but there's no evidence that it actually existed. I think that is circumstantial evidence. I'm not sure I agree with you. Unless they stopped using phone. wiring devices for the next five years after that. Phone calls. Um, some were recorded, some were not my recollection. Um, can, can we go over that really quick, Judge? I'm going to. I'm going over it right now. Yeah, I just wanted to, just to bring it to your attention. They've been, they've been portraying to the court telling you that there were 576 phone calls between Mr. Shahani and the defendant. I have gone through Mr. Shahani's phone records, and I've gone through the defendant's phone records. And on August 1st, there were 13 calls made by Mr. Shahani, eight to her, eight made by the defendant, and that's including even hang-ups that were zero, one, two, three-second phone calls. There were eight made by the defendant. On August 2nd, there was one made by Mr. Shahadi, ten made by the defendant. This is Mr. Muhammad Shahadi's records. On August 3rd, there were six made by Mr. Shahadi, seven made by the defendant, and on August 4th, there were six made by Shahadi and eight made by the defendant, and there were none on August 5th on Mr. Shahadi's record. On Ms. DePolito's records, there were 13 calls on August 1st made by Mr. Shahadi, seven by the defendant. There were two on uh, August 2nd by Mr. Shahadi, six by the defendant. On August 3rd, there were four by Mr. Shahadi, and there were four by the defendant. On August 4th, there were six by Mr. Shahadi, two by the defendant. And on August 5th, there was one by Mr. Shahadi, but the defendant was already in jail because it was 9.55 p.m. that night. For in both records, Mr. Shahadi made 26 phone calls between August 1st and August 5th to the defendant's phone. Total 26 phone calls and three texts. The defendant on Mr. Shahadi's records made 35 phone calls to Mr. Shahadi's phone and 19 on hers and five texts on both. So they keep portraying to the court and misrepresenting the amount of phone calls that were made between, and they've done it repeatedly to the court. They've put it in motions. They've told you to your face. They've misrepresented over and over and over again the phone contact between these two. And it, it, it's got to stop. 
because they have a, they have a duty to the court to provide truthful information, and they're off by 550 phone calls. They told you there were 576 phone calls from Mr. Shahadi to the defendant. It's 26. It's got to stop. Well, I appreciate the theatrics. I believe Your Honor did um, see at the motion to dismiss when Ms. DiBolito testified the phone records were, if I'm correct, um, introduced into evidence. So I guess we can rely on that. Well, I guess the records, I don't know whether the records are going to come in evidence in this trial or not, but I, I candidly wondered myself how there could be 576 phone calls between two individuals over that period of time. Um, but from my well, point, I'd be happy to readdress that when I have the fo all the phone records. Well, I mean, I can look at them, but... Well, you know, here's, here's what you're going to have to read, Mr. Rosenfeld. Went through them thoroughly. Um, regardless of whether the number is 26 or 500 or somewhere in between, in order for there to be um, a basis to either give a spoilation instruction or for due process grounds dismiss the complaint based on Arizona versus Youngblood, you must establish that something existed and was destroyed or lost. And so what evidence do you have if some of the calls were not recorded for whatever reason, either law enforcement was negligent in not recording or they didn't even know about them and didn't record them. That's not a basis, in my view, legally, to either dismiss the case or to get a spoilation instruction. For that, you must show that something actually existed and has been destroyed. That's my view of the law. Um, respectfully, Your Honor, the Fourth District Court of Appeals disagrees with you. They made it does. I read the cases you cited. You've miscited them for that proposition. When they talk about preserve, in each case, in each case, there was something that existed and the state failed to preserve it. In, in one case, there was a series of, there was the nanny cam case um, where there were like 80 hours worth of nanny cam film. They only took two hours, but there was 80 hours that existed at one time. They only kept two. Um, one of the fourth DCA cases, Daniels, specifically says, law enforcement has no duty or responsibility to record a criminal transaction. It's not a constitutional violation if they don't. Even the Powers case, which is cited in there, it reversed a trial court for dismissing a complaint on the argument that you're making. And it made the point there was no evidence that anything once existed and was not thereafter preserved. So when you're using this word preserved, preserved means something existed and they failed to preserve it, not that they failed to gather it in the first place. Your Honor, if I may respond to that. Um, Daniels was decided in 1997 by the fourth, Miro in 19... I believe, pardon me, I believe 2007, not the case in front of me, but it was at least a decade after Daniels, and I'm going to quote uh, Muriel on this, um, the distinction between collection and not preserving and not even collecting potentially exculpatory evidence is one without a difference. That's coming directly from Muriel. But you're misinterpreting the word preserve. Preserve, even in that case, what they're talking about is preserving that which existed at one time, not the failure to create, the failure to preserve. No, I, I agree with that, Judge, but you're missing the second part of the sentence, which is between collection, not preserving, and not even collecting is one without a difference. That's on page 452 at the top yeah, of the page. Yeah, not even collecting has to do with collecting that which exists. There's not a, can you show me a single, and this is all obviously relates and comes from federal law, Arizona versus Youngblood. There's not a single federal case, nor a single state case I've been able to ever find that said you would be able to dismiss a complaint uh, for a due process violation or even get a spoilation instruction because they failed to create evidence. In other words, they failed to record something that they should have recorded as opposed to failing to preserve or collect that which already existed. I have two points, Judge. One, I disagree with your interpretation of what collection means. Um, versus preserving. I think they're drawing this distinction for a reason. Um, two, even predating that, getting back to Daniels, which um, was about 10 years earlier, um, even if you are to 
um, assume that they do have no obligation to collect evidence, Daniels does suggest, and this isn't a holding, but there are, this is how I interpret certain statements made in Daniels, that there are certain requirements that can come in certain situations. Um, if you look at the second sentence quoted in my motion, certain duties arise, however, once a policy of gathering evidence through certain tests is established. So our argument is that Boynton Beach Police Department had certain uh, policies and procedures for gathering evidence. This get this, and having those policies, this gives them a duty, and they violated that duty. Um, one other point, Judge. Yeah, there's also a reference in Daniels, and once again, this is in the holding, but a reference on page 839 that law enforcement acts in bad faith in deciding not to record a transaction. And if I can grab the case, Judge. I have the case. I've, I've read all the cases. Page two, <clears throat> the record here also does not reveal, nor did the defendant ever assert, that bad faith in the part of law enforcement led to the decision not to tape the drug transaction. So I think you can establish a duty by them um, acting in bad faith, not to act in a certain way, Judge, and that's what happened here. Okay, I, I don't want to belabor this, I don't want to cut this short, but you and I are going to disagree on the law, and I guess I have to make that call. Unless you can establish, and to my knowledge, I understand your issue with respect to the call log, uh, unless there is evidence that uh, a particular phone call, for example, existed and has been lost or destroyed, um, unless there is evidence that the uh, meeting at Chili's was actually recorded and then later destroyed or lost, or that the meeting with Mr. Shaheda at the Boynton Beach Police Department was recorded and was later lost or destroyed, um, then my view is there's no legal basis for the relief you've requested, and that's my holding. So I'm denying the motion uh, to dismiss and for spoilation instruction. Now, I will tell you this, and I don't know what your case is going to consist of once you get to the defense case. Um, if evidence comes up during the course of the trial, which suggests to me, because trials have surprises, if evidence comes up during the course of the trial, which suggests to me that something did exist, hasn't been produced, has been lost or destroyed, there are consequences to that, and I'll certainly hear that. Um, but I think we have a fundamental disagreement about what the law is, and I have to make that call. My understanding of the law is unless it existed at one time, and they failed to, quote, preserve what existed at one time, or they destroyed something that existed at one time, or they failed to gather something that existed at one time, that there is not a constitutional due process violation, and there's no basis to dismiss the complaint um, or to get a spoilation of, of, of evidence instruction. So that's my ruling. That's my legal ruling. Obviously, if I'm wrong, the fourth will tell me, ultimately. Um, but I think, I mean, all of these issues, and I understand you tell me you've now looked at the uh, at the maintenance log, uh, or provided the maintenance log. These issues were vented in a different context in the motion to dismiss for outrageous conduct. They weren't raised in an Arizona versus Youngblood context. They were raised in a different context. But these issues were raised, so they're not issues I'm not uh, familiar with, and they're not issues I haven't looked at the record that you provided me on, which is, includes all the depositions and exhibits that you filed. So I'm going to deny the motion to dismiss because I think we have a fundamental disagreement about the law. Now, you come up with something that you can establish actually existed and was destroyed. Um, I will certainly consider that. Um, and probably the procedure, because even when you come up with that, it will depend on the nature of the prejudice uh, as to whether there would be a dismissal. More likely, it would be a spoilation instruction. So if, if during the course of the trial something comes up that establishes in my mind that something was lost or destroyed, um, I'll certainly give you the opportunity to repress that issue, but at this point I'm going to deny the motion. Well, just a few procedural issues, Judge. Um, so I'm assuming you're denying us an evidentiary hearing. In light of that, we cannot enter our exhibits into evidence, that being the maintenance log, and we need that to preserve our issue for appeal, and that would have been properly admitted during an evidentiary hearing. 
So we would request an evidentiary hearing on it. It's in the motion, Judge. I mean, you this this mo I, you know I asked for motions of limiting to be filed by Monday. This is not a motion of limiting. This is a motion I invited the defense to file after I denied the motion to dismiss on outrageous conduct. This could have been filed six months ago, and you could have asked for a hearing on it, and I would have given you a hearing on it. But on the eve of trial, to come in and say now you're filing this motion and you want to take additional evidence. Uh, it, it's it's candidly too late, and I'll, I'll let you put on whatever evidence you think you can put on this. I mean, what are you going to put on the maintenance log? You want to put the maintenance? We log move that into evidence, Judge. When you have that exhibit, I, I, I mean, I have any objection to the maintenance log going into evidence for purposes of this? I, they never sent me any of the emails, so I never got them. I, I did. So on the maintenance log, I don't have any problem putting the maintenance log in to preserve. I don't think the maintenance log itself is going to establish what other evidence would you put on of this other than the maintenance log. Um, is there anyone who will testify? Any witness who will testify? that something existed, for example, um, the maintenance log I assume would go to the meeting at Chili's, that this tape actually existed and has later been destroyed. I have evidence from Mr. Shaheda that he had a wire on, I have evidence from law enforcement that the wire malfunctioned, there was a dispute between law enforcement as to whether they should wait and get um, a functioning uh, listening device before they went forward. That's all great fodder for cross-examination. Um, but that's the evidence, in terms of testimonial evidence, that's the only evidence that we have. Is there any other testimonial evidence? Yes, <clears throat> pardon me. We would call a record custodian to discuss the uh, protocol for preservation of evidence, how the maintenance, how the maintenance of this equipment evidence is I did list the record custodian from Boynton Beach. Well, the records custodian could establish that this is a maintenance record. I don't know whether the records custodian can tell you anything about the maintenance of the equipment. He could lay the predicate for getting the, the log into evidence, I'm sure. I'm not even sure there's going to be an objection to that once we get a copy to Mr. Williams. Um, I mean, if that's the evidence you want to put on, I'm going to let you preserve your appellate record. So if that's the evidence, I'll find time to put that evidence into the record. Um, but basically what you're telling me is I'm relying upon Mr. Shaheda's testimony, which I'm already aware of, that he was wired, the testimony by law enforcement that there was a malfunction and the dispute that arose out of that malfunction. The only additional evidence that would be coming in on this issue that I've heard is the maintenance log and the policies and procedures with respect to maintenance. Um, that's all I've heard. I'll be happy to put that evidence and allow you at some point during the course of the next couple of days to put that evidence in so we can preserve your appellate record. But that's the only evidence I'm, I'm hearing that I can rely upon. Can I have one moment, Your Honor? Sure. <clears throat> Sergeant John Bonifero, who attested, he was the one who um, actually wired Mr. Shiade, um, testified that he properly wired him, everything was done according to procedure. And just a couple things, Judge. One, Mr. Williams did get a copy of the maintenance logs. They were filed with this court. Your Honor received a copy and uh, the state received a copy. Second, um, I understand your frustration with this being filed late, but this is exactly why I moved for the continuance. I was judged by me. Ms. Rosenfeld, you're, okay, I'm going to let you talk, but it's not just my frustration with that. What I'm asking you for is specific evidence that you have which would support what you're saying. What I'm hearing is you've got a maintenance log, evidence that you think I haven't considered yet. Um, I've considered the evidence that Mr. Shea testified he was wired. I'm assuming if this other officer comes in and testifies, he'll testify he wired him. You've presented me with deposition testimony and evidence that um, there was a malfunction, there was a dispute between law enforcement as to whether or not to go forward because of that malfunction. One officer saying we should wait, one officer saying no, let's go forward. Uh, and then the only other evidence I'm hearing um, is that you want to, one, present this officer to say that he properly wired Mr. Shaheda, and you want to bring in a person who will authenticate the maintenance log and perhaps talk about the policies with respect to maintenance. And I'm going to give you the right to do that to preserve your appellate record. 
I guess what I'm telling you up front, if that's the evidence you have, I don't know that it's going to change my conclusion at all about whether there's direct evidence that that meeting at Chili's once existed and was destroyed. I think the common sense approach here, Judge, you, you know, you have Boynton Beach Police Department officers claiming that this wire malfunctioned. If it malfunctioned, why was it never repaired? Why are there no records of that? The only logical conclusion is that there was a tape and it was destroyed. I don't think you can reach that logical conclusion. I mean, if that's, you, you, you want to establish as fact that something existed um, and you want me to reach the conclusion that it was destroyed because you have a main, I don't even know what this maintenance log shows at this time. I'm going to give you the opportunity. So if you want to subpoena people, get them subpoenaed for, it won't be during the, you know, I'll, I'll make time during the course of the trial. I'll hear this additional testimony so that you can establish your appellate record. Um, but what I'm telling you is unless you have evidence that these things existed and they were destroyed. If that evidence comes in, then I have to go to the second step. Then under Arizona versus Youngblood, I have to decide is it material exculpatory evidence, uh, whether it's um, only uh, useful evidence. I have, to, I have to go through the bad faith analysis. I have to do all those things, but as a prerequisite to even getting there, you have to come forward with evidence that these things existed. I'm assuming they were never listed on any discovery log ever provided by the state, in other words, they were, no tape was ever listed in discovery, and you can say, okay, there's, I don't, I'm assuming that's the case, there was, there was a listing of, of a tape, we've never seen that tape, where is it? Um, so if, if that's the case, maybe that takes us to a different level, but without evidence that these things existed, and they've been destroyed, lost, or failed to be preserved, there's no basis for the motion. So get whatever evidence, to, additional evidence together you want, I'll figure out when I'm going to do it, um, we'll get it in during the course of the trial, um, and I'll, I'll rule appropriately. But that's what you're going to have to show me. You have to present evidence that establishes that these things were once existed, and then they were destroyed. <coughs> Nothing says we can't provide circumstantial evidence. Whatever evidence you think is sufficient to persuade the court of the fact that these things existed and were later destroyed. And just one other thing, Judge, Your Honor had referenced the uh, United States Supreme Court standard for, you know, gathering evidence. We'd argue that the Florida Supreme Court can give greater protection to its citizens, and based on my interpretation of the Fourth's case law, they are allowing for gathered evidence, not just unpreserved evidence. Uh, well, that's just a fundamental disagreement. We have. No, I understand, Judge. Yeah, and I understood that from reading your motion. We just have a fundamental disagreement about what the law is, and I'm not always right on the law. The Fourth will tell me if I'm wrong. Um, so um, that's a fundamental disagreement. The other is a factual issue, okay? So I'm going to give you the opportunity because you, you, you want an appellate record. Um, I'm frustrated, yes, that you waited until now to file this motion when I invited you to do this six months ago. But frustration aside, if you've got additional evidence you want to put on beyond what we've just, you know, t what, what's already in the record, which seems to be the maintenance log um, and the fact that, and I don't know, may maybe the state at some point after looking at the evidence will, after talking to their officers, will concede that he was wired um, and that there was a malfunction. That's what the evidence seems to suggest. That's what the witnesses testified to. That was the dispute between the officers is saying whether they should go so Whether you need another officer to testify that, in fact, a wire was placed on Mr. Shaheda, I'm assuming one was. I'm assuming that that's what they were trying. They were trying to record these conversations. And so it sounds like the state is willing to stipulate that there was a wire on him. The question is, was there a malfunction? Or was there something more sinister here where the tape was destroyed? It existed and was destroyed. And our, our argument is that either way it's still a due process violation because on the first sentence it's ungathered and they easily could have gotten another wire. Um, Detective Ramsey testified that they should have delayed the meeting, that it wasn't exigent, that they could have pushed it back, and they didn't. And I'm saying there's only one way it can be a due process violation, and that is if it existed. I understand. Your, your, position, we have, your position is well preserved. It's in your motion, Mr. Rosenfeld. I understand your position. You think that by, the, by virtue of the fact that they didn't take reasonable steps to record that, that that's a due process violation, that they should have waited, they should have gotten functioning equipment, and they should have recorded it. Your position is with respect to the meeting with Mr. Shaheda at the Boynton Beach Police Department that lasted three hours, that should have been recorded, even though there's no evidence that it was recorded and destroyed. It should have been. You believe that's a due process violation. You believe that any unrecorded conversation between Mr. Shaheda and your client 
that was not recorded should have been recorded, and that's a due process violation. That's clear. That's your position. My position legally is that's not the law, that it has to exist and then be destroyed. But you've stated clearly your disagreement about your position on it. So that, I think, is, if I'm wrong about that, then that's an issue for appeal. Um, and so on that, that's a legal ruling. Um, the other is a factual issue. The state, I think, is now stipulating that and if you want to wait before you stipulate and check out the facts, that's fine, because I'm going to I'm going to allow the record to be established on this issue to make sure I don't have something here that I need to consider in terms of a tape existing and being destroyed, because that is a due process violation. Whether it be exculpatory or not, I guess, is another question. But um, even that threshold question, uh, if the state is willing to stipulate, based on their own investigation, that Mr. Shaeda was wired, but their position is, despite the wiring, the equipment malfunctioned, then we won't need this officer to say that he properly wired Mr. Shaheda. We'll still need whatever testimony you want to offer on the maintenance log and the policies and procedures if you want to put that in. And what I'm telling you is, at the end of the day, I have to conclude, have you presented sufficient evidence to convince me that something existed and it has been destroyed? So that's the additional evidence you want to present. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do it. I can't tell you when we're going to do it, but, but get your witness ready, get them subpoenaed, let's be ready to, to handle that. Um, now, if all you want to do is get the exhibit in, that is, establish its authenticity, I suspect if you and Mr. Williams discuss it, he'll probably stipulate to authenticity. What it means may be a different issue, and if you're just talking about threshold authenticity, it is what it purports to be, I suspect you'll get a stipulation on that. The question then becomes, do you want any additional testimony from a live witness with respect to it that can do anything other than authenticate it? So. <clears throat> yes, Judge, and what we wanted, and this is how our positions changed initially at the motion to dismiss hearing based on objective entrapment, our position was the wire malfunctioned. Now that we have the maintenance logs, we can cross-examine witnesses as to, well, if it malfunctioned, you know, where are the maintenance records? What did you do with these? You can still do cross-examination. That, that, that is all open, I mean, in terms of the trial, you're, 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 what's going to happen during the course of the trial? I don't know whether your client's going to testify as to what happened at the meeting. I don't know any of that right now. But in terms of your cross-examination of law enforcement and, you know, where's the tape and what happened to it, et cetera, to create an issue with respect to the credibility of that testimony, you're fully able to do that cross-examination, to show them the maintenance log, do whatever you think is appropriate, which you believe is going to impeach the credibility of those witnesses. So that issue still comes out in, in a different format, in a different way, but you're still free to challenge, you know, why didn't you do this, why didn't you do that, if you're going to state for the record that something happened at that meeting that, you know, is inconsistent with what the state's saying happened, because that just creates some issue with respect to who, who's credible and who's not. You're, you're going to ob obviously be entitled to do that. I said, just to be clear for the record, you're denying the evidentiary hearing, correct? And you're denying the motion with the caveat that if during trial it's established that the evidence was destroyed, you'll revisit the motion to correct. dismiss. If I hear any evidence in this case to suggest that something existed and has been lost or destroyed, we will immediately have a hearing under Arizona versus Youngblood and determine the consequences of that. So if I hear any evidence during the course of the trial that something existed and it's been destroyed uh, or lost, um, I'll make that finding and then we have to go to the second level of analysis. Was it material exculpatory evidence? Was it merely useful evidence? If it was merely useful evidence or potentially useful evidence, was there bad faith? The Supreme Court, I believe, of Florida has described bad faith as um, law enforcement knowing that evidence is exculpatory and intentionally destroying it. That's the definition of bad faith under the Florida Supreme Court definition. So yeah, if I, that evidence comes out, um, it's just like a Brady violation. If I hear in the middle of the trial there's a Brady violation or there's a discovery violation, I have to order Richardson here and we're going to do it. So if I get that evidence during the course of the trial, um, that's fine. I'll, I'll pause what we're doing and I'll handle it. Um, but at this time, the motion to dismiss is denied without prejudice. Uh, I'm not going to conduct a further evidentiary hearing prior to commencing trial. I will, though, give you the opportunity um, outside of the presence of the jury if you want to put on evidence uh, that you think establishes um, that the uh, tape at Chili's was existed and was lost or destroyed. I'll give you the opportunity during the course of the trial outside the presence of the jury. 
And I assume you're also finding that it's not a discovery violation? Correct. If something didn't exist, it can't be a discovery violation. And we, we make the same argument that the failure to collect would constitute a discovery violation. Okay. Again, there, I think it has to exist, and then they fail to turn it over to you. So I don't find that to be a discovery violation um, if it didn't exist. Um, again, if something, if we have to have a Richardson during the course of the trial, if the evidence comes up that something existed, was lost or destroyed, Arizona versus Youngblood, I'll have a hearing. I'll also consider it a discovery violation because it existed and wasn't disclosed. We'll conduct a Richardson. I'll go through the three steps, and we'll handle it that way. You're going to have the opportunity to put in these maintenance logs anyway. I'm assuming when you cross-examine whomever is going to testify with respect to this meeting, um, and so that evidence is going to be coming in, I will give you an opportunity outside the presence of the jury um, to put on any additional evidence at that time with respect to the maintenance logs and what you believe would establish that this thing actually existed and was lost. I'm just not going to conduct a second <coughs> evidentiary hearing now in advance of jury selection. I will cover this during the course of the trial, and if evidence comes out that suggests that um, I have to reverse myself, uh, I've reversed myself before, I'll do it. All right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, now there's two more, actually there's three more motions. Let me deal with an easy one, then we're going to get to um, two motions and limiting. Um, it's the defense's motion for additional peremptory challenges. Um, I'm going to hear from the state first, and... Um, and can I amend that quickly, Judge? Mm -hmm. Um, in asking for the additional preemptory challenges, that would also apply to the state. They would, you know, get the same additional ones that we were afforded. Well, yeah, that almost goes without saying. Sure, but, it, you know, I wasn't put in the motion. Okay. All right, yeah. You're, you're just asking for more than the six that would attach to a first degree. In light of the publicity, yes, Your Honor. And well, Your Honor, I'm going to comment on that. I, yeah, I do have a discretion. I'm going to ask the state's position, and then I'm going to kind of tell you how I feel about this. Uh, premature. Well, they're asking for it in advance of. And I would object. Yeah, um, I, I'm not. The publicity. We're, the publicity is a four cause. You're not going to use any peremptories, I assume, on publicity. That's a four cause challenge. So that you get as many of those as you have a basis to make the objection. So. Publicity would not be a reason to add additional peremptory challenges because if we find out that somebody has heard about the case, has reached opinions, uh, preconceived notions about the case based on what they've heard, you can challenge those for cause and I'm going to strike them. And so you won't have to use any peremptory challenges for that purpose. So I'm not inclined to grant additional um, peremptory challenges in the case on that basis or any other. Each side will have six. Um, Rules of criminal procedure, you get one for each alternate we select, you always get another strike. So, and I don't know whether we can discuss later how many alternates you want in the case. Probably at least two in a case like this, I would think. Um, so, I'm not going to grant additional peremptory challenges to either side. Obviously, if I deny a peremptory, if I deny a for cause, as we're going through jury selection and you follow the proper procedure to yeah, ask for additional. additional. Yeah, that's, that's fine, Judge. That's without prejudice to do that. That's always there. Okay, so we actually have two motions we haven't discussed, right? Um, we've got the motion in limiting to exclude the video of the Boynton Beach Police Department interviews and states objecting. So go ahead and just, I did read your motion, Ms. Rosenfeld, but go ahead and summarize your position there. We would argue this <clears throat> under 90.403 is unfairly prejudicial, Judge, as outlined in the motion. Um, there were two, t two interrogations, one with Sergeant Paul Sheridan and, the, and Detective Brian Anderson, the second with Officer Moreno. Um, and at the precinct was James Langley from Langley Productions, who's the executive producer of COPS. Was he in the room for the interviews? He was outside, and the issue is that Langley and Sheridan had an altercation, and I believe the state's not going to dispute this, stemming from Sheridan having... Who gets the consent? Um, exactly, sign, signing the waiver form. Basically, um, <clears throat> the problem being having an officer make somebody sign a waiver form for a TV show, someone in an authoritative position, is disconcerting. Um, and against cops' you know, policy and procedure. Subsequent to that, Langley filed an internal affairs complaint against Sheridan based on his conduct. Now, uh, that went back and forth for a while. I know ultimately it was unfounded, 
Um, however, he did take that step to call um, Boynton Beach Police Department and lodge that complaint. The Ferris complaint that was referenced in the motion to dismiss, I never quite understood what. Yes, <clears throat> yes, Your Honor, and this is, let me get, get into that for a minute. Um, when that was requested by Andrew Greenlee, and there's an email uh, back on my computer, the state suggested that it was destroyed. Now, I went back through all the discovery that Mr. Salmon was destroyed? That the internal affairs report was destroyed. Oh, the report was destroyed. Correct. And, um, you know, that might have even been in one of Mr. Salnick's motions for new trial. I'm not sure, but the email does exist somewhere. Um, I went back through all the old discovery, I think it was about 5,000 pages, and I did find the internal affairs complaint. It does exist. Since then, it has been destroyed. Back in 2009, some, or 2010, somebody you got it. You it through discovery? Um, found it. I did find it, Judge. Okay. I don't want to cut you off, but I, I do have a question about how it relates to the interviews themselves. All right, so during the, uh, the interrogation you have, YG, Mike DiPolito being paraded through the police department, um, well, the show cops did not have their own cameras there as they did during the stage crime scene. I mean, they're well aware that you have the interrogation videos, they play those. So this con was conducted in an interrogation room at Boynton Beach Police with their normal cameras? Yes, Your Honor. You have the production crew there. You have Sheridan and Langley in the back arguing back and forth about getting her to sign this waiver form. I mean, they're basically making this interrogation into a um, part of their television show. And to argue otherwise would be disingenuous. Why else would they be there? I mean, here's the connection. I'm missing something. You need to fill in, a, you know, things for me. What, what does the argument outside of the interrogation room over the consent form have to do with the actual interrogation itself? Is the entire <clears throat> between tricking her into, um, you know, signing this cops waiver form? There's several Miranda issues, which we'll address momentarily. Well, Miranda, Miranda is a different issue. Um, and that's, we'll address that momentarily, Judge. Um, you know, parading Y.E. Jean and Mike DiPolito through, which it goes without saying cops had a part in this. And you revert back to um, Sergeant Ranji's testimony. You know, back at the station, there was people wanting to be, I'm the best cop in the world, I solved this crime, and I'm the guy. This is what I'm going to chalk it up to. It's a whole big thing. It was like, are you kidding me? Really, we don't do that. Um, he then acknowledged that what could have been a good investigation got swept away when the sergeant walked in and took over. As you saw in the video, when he said that, he said it got swept away when he went in there and took over. And this was during his argument with... I haven't reviewed the video. With Langley. I don't have the video. Well, that's the problem. What you don't see in the video is right outside the interrogation room you know, cops in... Right, in order room. to exclude the video, I, I mean, what I'm hearing right now are things that occurred outside of the interrogation room. I suppose what you're saying is they may have affected the manner in which the interrogation occurred. But I think you're telling me right now occurred outside of the interrogation room. In other words, not in the presence of your client. And it's not recorded, Judge. You cannot hear it on the interrogation tapes. But so, so again, I'm, I'm trying to... I'm trying to figure out what the nexus is, what the basis would be. Now, there may be other bases to exclude all or portions of the interrogation. Um, Miranda violation, and I suppose we're going to talk about that, or you want to talk about it, Miranda violation. Um, the fact... No, that's not in the motion. So I, I didn't see it in the motion, but... but, but we're, not, we're not addressing that at this time. But there are... I guess you're saying, how does this relate to the 403 argument, and how is she? Right. I mean, how does it affect? I mean, sure. how does it affect the integrity of the interrogate? What what violation? What legal violation occurs such that I should suppress the the interrogation? Now, there, are, like I said, there are other issues that come up in interrogation. You may have particular portions of it which you believe are highly prejudicial. For example, if there's no response, if there's simply hearsay statements by officers and there's no admission or response by Ms. DiPolito, you could be moving to exclude portions of it on that basis because it's merely hearsay statements without response. So a, I know there's a lot of different attacks you could make on the video in part or in whole. And I don't know whether she, I haven't viewed the video, so I don't know whether she admitted to anything or didn't admit to anything. I don't, I don't know what the, what's actually there. Mostly denials, few admissions. 
Okay, but there, there is case law that says when all you get is denials and you're just making hearsay statements that portions of those could, that could be excluded. It would be the, it'd be responses to questions, admissions, things that would be relevant to the case. So um, what I'm suggesting is there may be a basis to exclude on some other grounds, portions or all of it. Um, but I'm just not, I'm, I'm missing the point here. I guess I'm missing how this creates um, any type of due process violation or, or something that would preclude the state from presenting the videos, assuming all of the things um, are copacetic. For example, Miranda's been given, it's not merely hearsay statements without responses to questions. In other words, all the things that you look for typically in a defendant's statement. What's the nexus? How does this, what's the legal nexus? So, <clears throat> just to be clear, you're asking how is this unfairly prejudicial under 90.403? Yeah, how does it, how does it create a 403 issue? Sure. I'm just going to quote your honor um, in the motion to dismiss, and you were referring to the stage crime scene, but this gets to my argument. Your honor had said, taking the action in a criminal investigation for the benefit of a television show or for any third party cannot be condoned. The business of law enforcement is enforcement of the law, not the production of theater. This was theater, Judge. When you have uh, Sergeant Sheridan, the lead detective in this case, going in and out of a room, bringing a cop's waiver form, going through a cop's waiver form for purposes of a television show, and the jurors are seeing this, how is that not going to unfairly prejudice Ms. DiPolito? I mean, this, it makes a spectacle out of you know, the entire proceeding, Judge the same way the stage crime scene would have, and the same, same way Your Honor found that that would have. Yeah, but I think there's a difference between a staged crime scene and an, inter an interrogation does occur in every criminal case in an attempt to get the defendant to make admissions, obviously. Um, that's, I think, different than a staged crime scene. My comments about the staged crime scene were simply that absent perhaps an attempt to show a consciousness of guilt, there really wasn't anything gained from that because the crime, if it were committed, had already been committed by that time. The, the crime of the solicitation occurs at the time of the solicitation, not later. But interrogating somebody about the crime, about the alleged crime, um, I think that falls in a different category than staging a crime scene after the fact. Um, candidly, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to view these videos and determine whether there's any portion of them, which I think is, because you're making a 403, so it's got to be you know, unduly prejudicial, okay? Um, so I'm going to have to review the videos, and if you've got specific, I don't think it would be appropriate to exclude an entire interrogation or two t entire interrogations based on what you've placed in your motion placed before me. It may be a basis to redact portions of it, which I find to be, unduly prejudicial um, or not probative of anything. Um, but I think just a, a blanket, the interrogation has to be thrown out on this basis on things that occurred outside of the interrogation itself, um, I think is too broad. I think it has to be more specific. But I, the first thing I have to do is review the videos, because I haven't reviewed the videos. Well, I can move them to Judge, if you'd like. I assume you have any review. objection to that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Williams. I'll be honest with you. one and two in evidence. Any objection to me reviewing these in chambers so I don't have to no, play them no, in the court? You can fit yeah. a lot of dead time, so if you just fast forward. No, I know where the fast forward button is. Um, just to uh, be clear and respond to Your Honor briefly, um, I think that this has more relevance than the stage crime scene. And that's what your honor seemed to suggest. What's the relevance to the stage crime scene? There's not much. Right. This is an interrogation. We're not, that's, we're not arguing that. We're saying it's unfairly prejudicial. Yeah, because, no, three, no. Let's take a step back here. I mean, how often in interrogation do you have a production crew creating a TV show, creating their, um, you know, their UC, their, you know, her then husband through, they're making a television show. Cops is behind it, they're in the back. But again, it may be a basis to exclude. I, I don't think, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reserve ruling on your motion, sure. um, and I'm going to review the tapes. I guess what I'm saying as a preliminary matter is, it would seem to me that what you're saying may be a basis to exclude portions of it, in other words, to redact it, um, whether it's the portion where Mr. DiPolito comes into the room, I don't know. Uh, there may be portions of it which would be unduly prejudicial and therefore inadmissible under 403. Um, and I would exclude those and require the state to redact. But my, my preliminary feeling is it's not a basis to throw out the entire interrogation. It, it depends on what I see and what portions 
I believe, are prejudicial. However, I'm not even going to get there. Yeah, I'm just going to rule that I'm going to defer ruling until I review these and see if I can see from these tapes the prejudice that you're talking about. Um, and your position, I assume, is they created not an interrogation, but a circus. Um, and that's kind of, those weren't your words, but you're saying basically based on the TV show Cops, this was just a production and not really a true interrogation, and that creates undue prejudice. That's Correct. Okay. And the juror seeing this spectacle would necessarily create I'll, I'll, um, I don't know, Mr. Williams, I don't know whether you want to respond to it any further. At this point, let me review it. Um, obviously, you believe that there are portions of that video, if not all of it, um, which are relevant. Um, I believe all of it's relevant and admissible, Judge. Well, it's good I review it in advance then anyway, because you may come in later. If I deny your motion in total, you may want to come in and say, OK, be prepared for this, by the way, Mr. Rosenfeld. Won't be next two days, because we'll be picking a jury. But be prepared for the eventuality that I rule it can't be excluded in total, but if there are specific provisions which you think are so highly prejudicial or non-responsive, all of the typical grounds, be prepared to give me the time um, in the video so I can go and look at them. In other words, kind of, um, I guess in criminal you don't do uh, designations and objections, but that's a good uh, That's fine, you're good, You understand what I'm saying when I yes. say designations and objections? So be prepared for that when the, before the video. And I want to do that relatively quickly because I don't, if I have to do redactions, I, don't, I want the state to have at least 24 hours or so to do those redactions before it's put into evidence file out. And we don't need to resolve this before jury selection. I'd agree with that. No, no, but be prepared. Sure. If I decide it doesn't come no, out at all, be prepared to tell me specifically which provisions you're having additional issues with, either because you think even if the whole thing shouldn't be excluded on a 403 basis, this should or that should, or the questions are simply hearsay with no appropriate response, so they're just an officer you know, putting out hearsay comments and discussion without any kind of reasonable response, even though they can do that for interrogation purposes, if there's no response coming back, that can be objected to, too. So be prepared to do that specifically, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Um, then the last one we have would be a motion to exclude prior bad acts. And I've read the motion. Let me ask Stay, if I may. Uh, Mr. Williams, which of these, I know you're objecting to the motion, are you saying all of this would come in? Yes, these have all been ruled on previously, except for D and E. So when you look under three, um, A. I, yeah, but it's, it's my trial now, so it's going to be my error of evidentiary sure. issues. So I, I mean, if, I want to make sure that if it's been raised, I want to make sure that I, I hear it again and, and I hear argument on it and I agree with the prior ruling. Um, because it'll be my name on the reversal this time if it's not right. Um, so understanding they were previously ruled on, or is this evidence that um, you intend to offer and for what purpose? I, I guess I'd comment first, in terms of the notice requirement, there was a Williams rule motion filed before and heard. I don't know that there's a requirement on retrial or refile um, in terms of the notice requirement. I think you can re-argue on a motion of limiting as to whether it should come in or not. I don't think that there is a notice requirement, Your Honor. I mean, this is, you know, the state insisted on going forward with trial with me having four weeks, four and a half weeks to prepare. Um, I didn't have discovery when I filed that motion to continue. As I've stated well, several times, yeah, it was... Somebody had discovery. I mean, it wasn't you. Right? Correct, Judge, but Your Honor is well aware what role local counsel plays. I mean, Your Honor is well versed in our core policy. That was local counsel. I didn't have discovery when Mr. Iglars withdrew. I didn't have discovery until the next day, and it is a ridiculous amount of discovery, and most of that discovery is, I'd say actually probably most is prior bad act evidence. And the state has given us no indication as to what prior bad acts they intend on um, trying to introduce in this trial, and it would have taken them, what, a total of five minutes to well, submit I'm a motion? I'm going now, because i got a rule on these things. Was Lori, are you going to take over? Is this, uh, are you tagging in? Hang okay. for a second. Um, we had informed Mr. Rosenfeld that we were relying on all the previous motions that were filed. There were extensive motions that, was, that were filed. There was the original motion to introduce the inextricably intertwined evidence. There was an amended motion filed um, back in April of 2011, and it outlined all of these things. As he said, he's well aware of the acts because he's admitting to the fact that it obviously is a voluminous part of the discovery in this case. 
Um, but it's outlined in those motions that it was sought to be introduced to adequately describe the deed uh, or the crime that's alleged to provide an intelligent account of the crime charge, establish the context in which this entire charge or this entire crime arose um, and the events leading up to it and uh, to provide a motive for that crime. And I get that, but which, let me just ask this question, Ms. Lori. I mean, I, I would tend to, well, your, your position is it really isn't collateral crimes or similar fact evidence. It's offered for a different purpose in any event, but I got that because um, I, don't, I don't think it is similar fact evidence. Um, but in the motion, um, Ms. Rosenfeld has identified specific evidence that they believe you're going to seek to introduce. And what I'm asking up front is, is that correct? Is this, is all the things listed here evidence that you intend to introduce? And if it is, as I said, I want to hear argument on it because it will be my name on the appeal. I mean, in other words, there's a motion on limiting that's been filed. I want to make sure that I rule on the motion on limiting, okay? So um, is this all evidence that you intend to offer? Is there anything you don't intend to offer? I don't want to argue over things that aren't an issue. Judge, I would tell you that everything on there would... Potentially be intended to be argued. Yeah. Fair. Okay. That's all right. So your answer is everything's in play. Yes. Except for there were two on there that I didn't think uh, D and E. About a domestic disturbance? The April 2nd, 2009 domestic disturbance report and um, potentially the one on May 1st of a spoofed phone call from a quote unquote officer Hurley. Well, potentially. I mean, I'm just trying to narrow the issue. Is that something you want to offer or not offer? Those now. You can take off. D and E, we're going to agree to take off. And so what we're really dealing with are A, B, C, F, G, H, and I. Okay. So go ahead, uh, Ms. Roseman. I'm going to, it's a motion limiting, even though there was a prior ruling. Um, your motion, you're moving and limiting in front of me. I'll hear it. So. Well, at first, these allegations are absolutely outrageous, but uh, legally, I mean, the evidence isn't relevant. It's not inextricably intertwined with the alleged solicitation, and it's just unsupported by clear and convincing evidence. Now, the, the law in regard to the evidence not being supported by clear and convincing evidence... It's Williams' rule, all right. Well, I guess we could start with that, Judge. Um, I mean, I have to initially... Am I correct about that? When we're talking about clear and convincing, that's the standard when we're trying to introduce similar fact evidence, collateral crimes, i.e. Williams rule. And I, what I hear the state saying, and I'll have to rule on it one way or the other. That's correct, Judge. No, let, me, let me rephrase that. To be intricately intertwined, the evidence must be necessary and not helpful. It has to be necessary to adequately describe the deed, provide an intelligent account of the crimes charged, establish the entire context out of which the charge crime arose or adequately describe the events leading up to the crime. And none of these prior bad act evidence are necessary to describe the alleged solicitation of Mr. Gene. None of it's necessary to provide context. None of it's necessary to provide an intelligent account. And once again, the standard isn't, is it helpful? Sure, it's helpful. Any prior bad act evidence is always helpful, but it's not necessary. They can put forth um, their case without this evidence. They can just as easily show that um, she went to Mr. Shihada and go forward with the allegations of the probable cause affidavit. These aren't necessary, and without meeting that standard... Let me ask this. I, th I think we're there, but I just... The way my brain thinks is I've got to make sure I understand exactly what analysis we're doing. So you're, you're, you tend to be agreeing that this isn't, it's not similar fact evidence, it's not collateral crimes. None of these things are crimes. Um, and so it's not, a really, it's not really a Williams rule analysis. It is the inextricably intertwined analysis that apply, and your position is it has to be necessary for that to apply to you. For, to and this is based on the notice that was provided in the 2011 trial when they did give notice. They made two arguments. They argued that it was it should come in because it was inextricably intertwined, and, and second that it was Williams' rule. So, you know, in my motion, I address both issues, not just. Um, let, me, let me make a preliminary ruling so we can kind of focus the argument. 
First, I think notice was, I don't think they have to re-notice if it was noticed for the trial before. Uh, that, that notice, I think, is sufficient. But nevertheless, I don't think it's Williams Rule evidence. I don't think it's, it, it can't be offered as, um, it's not similar fact evidence and it's not collateral crimes. Um, so it wouldn't come in under Williams Rule. If it's going to come in at all, it would have to be inextricably intertwined. And so that's, I, I think that's the analysis, whether it's inextricably intertwined. Um, so I'm not viewing it as Williams Rule evidence because I don't think that's what it is. So narrowing the issue in that way, defense position is that nevertheless, it has to be not just helpful but necessary. This evidence is not necessary. So, Ms. Lori. Judge, I would argue that it, um, and I do agree with the court's analysis that it's, it's obviously they're not crimes. It's, um, it's being offered to place this entire situation in a context to show her intent um, of taking money from him and her intent to have his probation violated, um, have him taken away. And when those things don't, and the different acts that she goes through to affect that, and when those fail, ultimately her actions of having him killed because jurors a lot of times may sit back and ask themselves even though the state's not required to prove motive ask themselves why would somebody do something like this and you know it's kind of like jury selection when we're sitting there and we're asking questions in this vacuum and jurors go well i don't kind of understand what you're saying it's just, it, these facts help are, are inextricably intertwined in her entire dealings and why she ultimately did what she did okay mr rosen I mean, there's, there's no evidence as to any of these. These are, I mean, they're, they're a joke. I think that's the best way to oh, wait, describe them. And they've got to put forth evidence to get this. Um, if there's no evidence, there'll be no evidence. I mean, they're, they're just going to be outrageous allegations and assertions. And let's deal with, I mean, we'll go through them one at a time. We'll go through a few of them. Uh, Mr. Shihade's claim that Mr. Ms. DiPolito discussed killing her husband with Larry. All right, first of all, let's go back to his burn notice episode he made uh, prior to this happening. Um, the person in that episode's name was Larry, which is convenient, but I mean, her testimony or any testimony about a conversation with Larry is not only hearsay, but it's, there's gonna be a huge confrontation clause violation. And they're trying to get that in. How are we gonna? Well, okay, but, uh, again, step at a time. That may be, it, it may be that they can't get any of this evidence in because of hearsay objections, including confrontation clause objections. That may be, but in a motion of limiting, what you're asking me to do is say they can't even try. Okay, that's, so you may be correct that ultimately that they've alleged these things, but they're not going to be able to put on any evidence because they won't be able to do it within the confines of the evidence code. But that's not the issue I have to deal with today. That's, that's a contemporary, contemporary objection to any, any evidence they try to put on. They put on a witness and you think it's pure hearsay and it's being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted and you object based on hearsay. I sustain that objection, it doesn't come in. But that's, we're not there yet. What we're here doing right now is you telling me they shouldn't even be able to attempt to put this evidence in because you feel it's either not relevant um, or it's overly prejudiced or it's not inextricably intertwined whatever the argument is, but in terms of the where we're at now, all we're dealing with is a preliminary ruling as to whether or not they should even be permitted to try. And this isn't an evidentiary ruling as to whether or not they have sufficient evidence of any of this. They may not. They may not have any admissible evidence that they can offer. They could go before the jury, but I won't know that until I hear what they've got to say. And my response to what he's saying is I agree with the court's analysis of this. It's, an, it's a question of is it something that the, the state can even attempt to address to bring into a trial? And while he may think that they're outrageous or outlandish, that's an issue for cross-examination. Um, it's an issue for an argument and a closing to a jury if the evidence was admitted into the trial, but it doesn't affect the courts, in my opinion, it doesn't affect the court's ruling in determining whether it's inextricably intertwined, whether he thinks it's outlandish. And this, it's going to be a circus, and we're just going to create 403 after 403 arguments. I mean, you're going to have someone get up there, and we're going to have to break every five minutes while they start talking about um well but that may be but that happens i mean that's what a trial in the evidence yeah, is well, the, the, state, the state needs some sort of i mean good and they're going to put on evidence and they're going to put on evidence for example you know regarding a conversation with a
there's no Larry, and they're putting in on their motion in limine, they intend on doing this, knowing that it's going to be a confrontation clause violation. Why not address it now? Why not go through each one of these and address how these well, would be? I don't know how they're intending to get these things in. I mean, that's not what I would do on a motion in limiting. Uh, the, the motion in limiting deals with, again, can they even try? Can they even attempt to put this evidence in? Is there some legal basis which would exclude them from even trying to put the evidence in? It may be that I have to, you know, I, I may have to have uh, proffers outside the presence of the jury to figure out whether this evidence is admissible. If I rule that it's up front not admissible because they shouldn't be able to try because it's not inextricably entwined, we're not going to go through that. If I rule that they get the opportunity, then we'll just have to deal with it like any other evidentiary issue that comes up in a trial. And I'm certain we're going to have plenty of those in this case, but that's, I think, procedurally, that's the way it has to go. Um, so the argument I'm going to focus on now is, can they try? Are these things inextricably entwined? Do they tend to explain the deed um, and put the deed into context in terms of what was occurring um, uh, prior to um, the alleged events um, that make up the case? So that's where, that's where I'm at right now. Um, so Ms. Roosevelt, if you could focus on that. I know you've already briefly discussed that, but that's, that's the argument, whether or not these things are inextricably entwined, do they, ex do they tend to explain the deed, I suppose, do they tend to go to the issue of, because I know entrapment's probably going to be a defense in the case, do they tend to go to the issue of predisposition, do they have any relevance for that, those kind of things. And well, in regard to the allegation I was referring to in involving this uh, mystery person, Larry, that the state refers to, I don't see how that's necessary to establish context um, in any way. It doesn't, you know, change the fact that she allegedly went to, you know, Muhammad as the state claims that their theory is that it was for purposes of, you know, violating his probation. That doesn't go to that. That's simply a collateral uncharged crime um, that she tried to solicit Muhammad back then. Then you have um, another allegation was that, made at one point, was that she took a um, gun from Muhammad's car. I mean, that has nothing to do with the solicitation. That's just another outrageous assertion, and that one's beyond outrageous because Muhammad gives several different accounts. Yeah, I think you and I are looking at two different. Yeah, I'm looking at different motions. I'm looking at yeah, I'm looking at your motion and limiting, and the allegations contained in paragraphs three a through I, and I'm not seeing any of those things. Now, a couple of those, sorry, a couple of those I put in the body of the motion and not in the facts Okay, section. so they're not in the front, they're not in the front section, they're someplace else. Okay, where, where are they? It's on page seven. Bottom of page seven, the last paragraph. And this is evidence they went into in the first trial. Alleged attempt. Okay, I got it. Now there are three, four things there that were not contained in the statement. Well, some of them were, I believe. Number four was in the statement of facts, and number one. Okay. All right. So um, your position is. Uh, I don't know what um, this nonsensical allegation of her trying to steal Mr. Shihade's gun how that's necessary, and I'm going to stress that over and over again, it's necessary, not helpful, to establish anything, to establish context, to establish, um, to adequately describe the deed. I mean, we're dealing with a, you know, the, tr the crime she's charged with is meeting with, you know, Wadi Jean and soliciting, you know, him to commit this crime. I mean, that's the crime, Judge. This has nothing to do with that, and it's not necessary. And the state's putting forth all these allegations that sure would be helpful to their case, but they're also so unfairly prejudicial. And, I mean, they're just such strong bad character evidence that we run the risk of her being, you know, convicted based on those, based on unnecessary evidence, unhelpful evidence. Okay. Um, Ms. Lauren. Judge, I mean, the gun allegation is pretty simple. Um, she's charged with solicitation to kill her husband with a firearm. She goes to Muhammad Shihada 
to help her get someone to kill her husband. Um, the fact that she's stealing a gun or taking his gun further explains her and shows her intent to definitely effectuate this crime. And I believe if I'm memory serves me right that at one point on a recorded video with him she basically says well if this guy isn't going to do it I'll just alludes to just doing this herself um, so those things all tie back into the fact she's got a firearm um, as far as um, planting the drugs I guess if we're on page seven his number one he attempts to plant the drugs in the car these all go back to the kind of the condition trying to violate probation right um, as far as attempting to hire Larry, um, it, he talks about the Larry being one of these guys from Riviera that she talks about. These guys came by her house, that she, they still call her sometimes, but she's blowing them off. Um, again, it's just attempts of someone else to effectuate this crime um, in her master plot. It, it, it all is would, little... I'm just curious about something. Who would testify to that? It would be Mr. Shahada that would testify that these are statements. Oh, by statements her. from the defendant. Yes. All right. um, and then the attempt to divest her husband of title to his home was not actually an attempt. She did have him sign over um, the title, and again, that just factors into why this occurred. And I understand that the court, obviously, as with any piece of evidence, has to do a 403 balancing test, but. I hate to say it, but evidence often is prejudicial. Um, you know, I mean, that's not just... All evidence is prejudicial. Right. 403 is I mean, the prejudice, the, does the uh, prejudicial, is the probative value outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice? That's the 403. Well, the state proves my argument. The state suggests that there's a video where she refers to um, a gun and doing it herself. So if that's the case, then this... I'm going to call it a lie by Mr. Shihade that she attempted to steal his gun is helpful, not necessary. And that's my point. These are helpful things for the state, not necessary things. It is when, necessary to help put everything into a context to explain why someone takes the actions that they do. Um, and whether he thinks Mr. Shahada's statement is truthful or not is an issue for cross-examination of Mr. Shahada, um, not a question of whether he thinks Mr. Shahada is credible or not. It doesn't go to the admissibility of that evidence. It goes to the weight of that evidence. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I think I've got both of your arguments. We're kind of going in circles. I'm going to take these under advisement, and um, I'll give you a ruling on these timely before you have to be in your uh, voir dire. Um, I said, uh, I might have one or two more points, Judge. Sure. I, if I can just refer to the um, divestment of property. And, you know, obviously the state also needs a good faith basis as to what the evidence is going to show. And based on the allegations about the sole ownership of their marital home, I believe that was disproven by the attorney involved in the transaction. And Mr. DiPolito um, said the transaction was necess necessary for him to receive a grant or loan. I'm going back to the first trial here. Um, and their attorney said that he did not suspect any fraudulent activity at the time they executed the transaction. So, you know, the state getting into this and trying to have the jurors infer this nefarious intent is so unfairly prejudicial based on the previous evidence. I mean, and same with, you know, this getting back to um, the gun. Mr. Shiati's story changed so many times. And I know, you, you know your honor could argue, sure, that's for impeachment. Well, yeah, I, I understand that, however, when it's, when they don't have, when it's, such an, when it's prior bad act evidence, but it's so unfairly prejudicial, and you have Mr. Shiade saying, one, it happened at a convenience store by his cousin's house. Two, it happened at a mobile gas station by Ms. DiPolito's house. Three, it happened after Mr. DiPolito claimed that she left something in his car. Four, it happened when he left Ms. DiPolito in the car to make a purchase from the convenience store. I mean, this is, these are, you know, clearly established actions. These are outrageous allegations that the state is clearly using to draw nefarious intent to have her convicted for um, collateral crimes they can't prove because they never occurred. She never committed these acts. And it, she'd be completely deprived of a fair trial. I mean, this is an outrageous due process violation, get, getting into any of this. And, you know, you want to take it a step further, and just getting back to young blood, and your honor's going to, um, that I'm my reasoning here, but um, there were 911 calls, and this is a, a third argument as to why this stuff should not come in. 
There were 911 calls in relation to several of these incidents, and I'm going to begin with the Manalapan incident. That's at the Ritz, it's now the O, that she planted drugs and that an anonymous female caller called. I think Ms. DiPolito has a pretty distinctive voice. I requested the Manalapan 911 call. I requested the West Palm Beach 911 call in relation to the City Place incident. Both of those calls are gone. They did not preserve those calls. So this is a little different than the previous incident, but they do record those. They did not preserve those calls. Now, if they get into any of those actions where a female caller allegedly made this 911 call, we can't play the tape and say, you know what, that's not Ms. DiPolito's voice. So in that case, Judge, according to your analysis of young blood, and this isn't in the motion, I'm just... Can I ask a question, Mr. Rosemont? Yes. Wouldn't, before the evidence on, wouldn't they have to have some, not speculation, but wouldn't they have to have some competent evidence that was her that made the call? Uh, and that's their argument. The last trial came in. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know. But I, I mean, I'm just saying, if somebody gets on the stand and says, I got this phone call, the person didn't identify themselves, I think it was Ms. DiPolito, without establishing any basis for saying that, that's, that wouldn't be admissible. Cause that's it, my concern. There's not competent evidence for these allegations, and they're going to they're gonna put it on. The juror's going to hear it. But I'll tell uh, you yeah, I don't know that that's that the case. I, don't, I mean, I, again, I, we're... we're it's cart before the horse, I think, is the issue. Um, yes, they have to have competent evidence. And just to say that there was an anonymous phone call and there's no ability to link that phone call to Ms. DiPolito, they just say we got a phone call, um, I would tend to agree with you. That's probably not admissible. But I, I haven't gotten into whether the evidence is sufficient for purposes of admissibility. Again, it's just, do they get the, are these issues, are these things that they want to raise of such a nature that they should not be permitted at all in the case and not even given the opportunity to establish it by competent evidence? That's the stage I'm at. Uh, I would say no. I'd say they're not in no, I know, I know your position. I'm just really prejudicial, and we have a young blood issue now where we can establish that all those calls are recorded, and I have the uh, records custodians from Manalapan and from West Palm Beach under subpoena that they were not preserved. There is no 911 calls from either of those dates back in 2009. And we could easily have played those and showed that it was not Ms. DiPolito's voice calling. It wasn't her calling. And now because of that... What evidence is there there was? I don't want to get, look, I've stated my position. I'm not going to get into making specific evidentiary rulings based on the competency of the evidence that's being presented. Um, and I'll restate what I've already stated a hundred times. I'm not making those rulings now. I'm just determining whether they get the opportunity to try. It, it is inconceivable to me that, number one, that they, on that issue, even if I say, if they could prove that, that it would be inextricably intertwined and therefore would be something that would be admissible, Having said that, if they don't have competent evidence to do it, it's not going to get in. If they don't have evidence to establish that a jury could reasonably conclude, based on the evidence, not on mere speculation, that if the woman's voice on that phone was that of Ms. DiPolito, then it's not admissible. And then if it did come in, candidly I'm not sure how at this point, but if it did come in and we had a an issue, uh, either Arizona versus Youngblood or otherwise, I'd obviously take it up. But again, the preliminary issue is just, are these the types of things that they should be able to bring into the case or not, if they have competent evidence to do so? And we would say no. Not any well, I know you say they don't have competent I don't know whether they have competent evidence. Yeah, unfairly prejudicial, even if they were, they should be intertwined. Yeah, right. Okay, I understand that. I, but that's the, the stage on that now is, do they get the attempt to try? Do I cut them off right now and say, you can't even try to establish these things because they're either not inextricably intertwined um, or on a 403 analysis, probative value outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice. So that's where I'm at now. Whether these things actually come into evidence is an evidentiary ruling I would have to make when I hear from the state how they intend to prove these things if I allow them to attempt to prove them. So I, 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 any ruling, first of all, I'm still going to reserve on this. I want to take, I want to look, think this over a little bit and, and kind of put it in context. So I, I will do that. Um, but I'm not, if I deny your motion, that doesn't mean that evidence is ultimately going to come in. Because if it's not competent, 
if there isn't a basis, you know, to get that evidence in, it's not coming in. Just like any other evidence, it's subject to the rules of evidence, um, and it'll be excluded if you can't get it in. And the, Canley, I'm not sure how that phone call comes in, but maybe you'll tell me at the appropriate time. Well, this is my concern about, um, you know, if Your Honor were to deny our motion. Um, I think, you know, in a situation like this, it's appropriate to have an evidentiary hearing for each allegation and for the state to put forth evidence to show these are inextricably intertwined. They can't just make allegations and say, oh, you know, this is going to happen, wait for trial. I mean, how can your honor rule and determine they are inextricably intertwined? It's the subject matter. I'm looking at the subject matter of the proposed testimony. Is the subject matter of the proposed testimony such that it could be considered inextricably intertwined? That's the analysis up front. The evidentiary analysis is the competency of the evidence that's being presented. And that's, that's how I'm viewing it. That's how I'm going to approach your motion on limit. I'm going to determine is the subject matter, assuming they have competent evidence, which is, would be admissible under the rules of evidence, come in as inextricably intertwined. That's the ruling I'm going to make up front. That ruling, if I grant your motion, then that, I'm going to get a chance to try. If I deny the motion, it's still without prejudice to the defense raising evidence objections to anything they're trying to put in, because it still has to be competent evidence. It can't be mere speculation. Um, you know, if it's hearsay, unless it's, you know, it's, if it's a statement, obviously, of Ms. Dipolito itself, it's an admission of a party. But if it's statements between two other people and it's hearsay, it's hearsay. So it's, 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 and it's being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted, it's not going to come in. You know, that's the way it is. So, I mean, I understand your argument. If you want to make any other specific arguments about the motion, I'll give you the opportunity to do so. I don't want to cut you no, off. We rest on Ritz v. State, 101 Southern 3rd, 939. That's the fourth DCA case. Um, and it Ward talks v. about State the standard under. About, you know, and just defines, you know, helpful versus necessary. And I think. You know, well, that's, uh, frankly, that's what I'm kind of focusing on right now. And the 403 argument and, you know, the young blood issue. Okay. That's, we'll stop there. Yeah, I think young blood is a little different, but it depends on what they try to present. But, um, okay. I, I got, I'm going to take that under advisement and, um, and consider these issues. But again, it's subject matter. Can this subject matter be offered or not? Um, and if it can be offered, then they have the burden of doing it by uh, competent evidence. Just the other thing that I would add in the court's consideration of all of this is, um, you know, I know that in the motion to dismiss when the defendant testified, a lot of her testimony revolves around the fact that this was a um, skit or a script that was fabricated by herself, Mr. Um, Shihada, and her husband. And in order to explain why that is untrue, um, it, these acts and these and these uh, different events are necessary to show to a jury, no, this isn't what she's saying or what they're alleging that it is. This is this idea that she came up with after all of these other attempts to have her husband's probation violated, have him taken out in other ways, didn't work, then this is why this happened. And that's why I would also say it's necessary. I understand the argument. I'm just going to focus on whether it's, you know, under the standard. Yeah, I don't think it's like you. I don't, I don't think it's similar fact evidence. I think it would have to come in another way. Um, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to do that analysis for myself and after hearing your argument make a ruling. Um, but again, it will be without prejudice. And actually, any motion.